Well, <laughs> welcome everybody to the, the first talk in uh, the, the fall 2001 Department of Anthropology Colloquium Series here at the University of New Mexico. Um, I'm really excited for today's speaker and I'm also very excited for the, the speakers that we have uh, scheduled for the rest of the semester and we're already starting to uh, uh, get uh, a list going for next semester as well. So this will be a really great year. Um, as you all are aware, because you're here, um, the, the time of the talks has changed this semester to, to 2 p.m. Uh, uh, mountain time on, on Fridays. Um, and uh, it, as in the past, uh, um, we will, uh, I'll ask you all to turn off your cameras and your, your microphones during the talk. Um, and during the question and answer period at the end, uh, you can turn your camera back on if you want to, to ask a question. Um, if you do have a question that you don't want to forget, uh, feel free to just drop it in the chat and we can uh, address it at the, the end of the talk. Um, otherwise, as I said, we'll just, we'll just save the questions uh, till the end. All right, as I said, I'm very excited to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Russell uh, Greaves, or Rusty, as, as we, many of us know him by. Uh, Rusty received his PhD at UNM in 1997, and we're thrilled to have him back here at UNM. He has uh, just accepted a position as the director of the UNM Office of Contract Archaeology. He is also an adjunct research associate professor in the Department of Anthropology here at UNM. Uh, Rusty has nearly 40 years of archaeological research and cultural resource management experience. He has worked primarily in the American Southwest, uh, the Great Plains, Texas, and Great Basin regions, in addition to, to other uh, places. Rusty has performed uh, uh, cultural resource management work and research archaeology in um, an array of, of Paleo-Indian, archaic, late prehistoric, and, and archaeological uh, sites. Uh, he has worked on many um, historic period Native American, Spanish, Hispanic, European, and African American sites. Uh, Rusty has experience with hunter-gatherer, small-scale agricultural, and complex society archaeology, so really a, a diversity of, of research and time. Um, he has a significant experience in a range of innovative survey, uh, excavation, and analytic methods in geoarchaeology, zooarchaeology, and paleoethnobotany, um, and also has a lot of archival and museum research experience. He has also performed some really important uh, and, and fascinating ethno-archaeological uh, work in, in New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Louisiana, uh, Venezuela, and also Mexico. He maintains active ethno-archaeological research interests, especially in relation to ongoing investigations among uh, uh, Yucatec subsistence Maya agriculturalists and extensive research um, with mobile savanna Hume hunter-gatherers in the Orinoco Plains. Uh, Rusty, as I mentioned, is a, 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 a research uh, associate professor, adjunct research associate professor here at UNM. He also uh, is a research associate of the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology at Harvard and a consulting scholar in the American section of the Penn Museum in, in Philadelphia. So it's really wonderful to have Rusty with us and, and special to have him as the, the, the first speaker in uh, the, the colloquium series this semester. So thank you very much, Rusty. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Ian and everyone for inviting me and allowing me to have the opportunity uh, with you folks. Um, I did try to put this together a little rapidly, um, but I hope that what I'm going to present today is of interest to um, all of you folks, especially the archaeology folks. I've focused on an ethno-archaeology approach but also I'm hoping to, to demonstrate the crossover in the importance of considering the integrity of all aspects of the anthropological record of ethnography, of biological anthropology, um, archival and museum work, as well as archeology. span So without any further ado, I'm gonna to go to my presentation. As I mentioned, what I'm uh, presenting today is some work that's not necessarily the focus of some of the research work, but this is information that came out of the ongoing work that I've done in ethnoarchaeology, both in Venezuela um, and with Yucatec Mayan agriculturalists in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. Um, what I've chosen today is to look at two very critical aspects of human resource use that 
observations outside of some of my initial research design allowed me to have some inferences that I think are of value when thinking about how we use the ethnographic record ethnoarchaeologically to improve the ways that we can think about accessing information archaeologically. Um, I strongly oppose this kind of perspective in this first slide of imagining that archaeology is, is recreating the life as the individuals in the past lived it that we can see. Obviously, that's not what archaeology um, is able to do. We are not able to recreate the daily lives. We have an, a geologic record that represents significant time and geologic processes. We have a very different perspective on how we want to learn about behaviors in the past that are relevant uh, to us. And today I'm going to focus on two aspects, as I said, that were kind of peripheral to some of my major research trajectories, but have been really interesting uh, aspects of what the research is showing me. So I'm gonna to start today with uh, thinking about fire and hearths. And as my last slide indicated, the concern about the human use of fire extends back probably further than we actually have any real evidence uh, for it. The past slide was from one of the Chinese publications about Zhou Tian. Uh, during the period of time where uh, there was a significant promotion that uh, uh, inhabitants of the cave were uh, using and controlling fire regularly. The recent surveys of evidence for fire show that uh, the uh, archaeological evidence is most concerted after 350,000 uh, years ago. Um, so despite some researchers' insistence that minimal evidence for thermal activity is likely to be evidence for the human controlled use of fire. There's certainly a lot of ambiguity in, in some of these early records. Obviously we need to know something about what real hearths and real controlled use of fire is because it's a critical component of how we think about the organization of the archeological record. Um, one of the most fascinating exposures to seeing Uncontrovertible, incontrovertible evidence of hearths was when um, Ofer Yosef presented information on the hearths at Kebara that are not only are they individually identifiable as minimally uh, uh, basined kinds of concentrations of charcoal or surface hearths, but they're also continuously in the same location, showing a behavior through time at Kebara that. Um, uh, Bar Yosef, with his significant geoarchaeology background, felt represented a significant period of time of Neanderthals using Kibara Cave in the same manner where the hearths were located principally towards the front of the shelter. So some very consistent information about what the archaeological record showed us um, at that location. Hearths are obviously critical to us in archaeology because they present um, ways that we can structure our observations. Instead of just being a, an artifact concentration, hearths are the focus of particular kinds of activities and often a diverse group of activities. So they provide that absolutely critical site structural anchor for helping to interpret deposits in their vicinity, as well as helping us to better understand um, other portions of the archaeological record outside of where we find that particular hearth. My next slide shows an example of this from a work that I participated on from another a couple of graduates, um, Dave Rapson and Larry Todd at the Bugis Holding uh, Proto-Historic Site in, uh, the, uh, in northwestern Wyoming. These are hearths that were carefully piece plotted where everything five millimeters and larger was mapped and then bone and some uh, 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 artifacts were rejoined across these different hearths. And thanks to the conjoin uh, abilities that we had with these materials, it was possible to look at a trajectory of the butchering and processing of remains at this particular site. So this is just an example of how Hearth-focused activity 
it allows us to find a whole bunch of other things that are of critical interest to us in how to interpret overall site activity and set up our expectations for what other aspects of work we need to do. So I don't need to convince the archeologists that HARs are critical, but I want to now explore what my ethno-archeological approaches to this have been after giving some introduction to the ethno-archeological work that I've done with the Pume. The Pume are located in this part of uh, Venezuela, the uh, south, uh, west central portion of the country near the Colombian border, along a number of major interfluves that um, uh, are tributary or fluvial systems that are tributaries to the Orinoco River. The Pume population is currently approximately eight, maybe 9,000 uh, individuals. Recent census data in Venezuela have been highly confounded because of a number of people claiming indigenous ancestry who in the past did not. But essentially you have two economic divisions within the Pume. You have the river Pume living along these major drainages of the Orinoco, who in the past were semi-mobile foraging and horticultural populations who now live in sedentary communities along these major rivers, are invested in significant amounts of horticulture, or almost agriculture, uh, still some foraging and a little bit of wage labor. There are some river communities that live identically to uh, Venezuelan nationals in this area, the uh, Criollos, um, and, and they are either fully agricultural or uh, perform labor. Um, a small segment of the Fume population have been and still are hunters and gatherers between these major drainages, the Savannah Pume. And they, during the last period of time that we had reliable census data represent about 1,000 individuals out of that total population of 8,000. And this slide nicely shows the difference in condition. River Pume have access to a significant amount of market foods. The Savannah Pume still rely almost exclusively on food that they forage and the small amount of horticultural involvement uh, that they have. The uh, ethnography of the Pume extends back into the uh, latest 19th century. All of this work was done with river populations, the river Pume that were much easier to access uh, along the major travel routes. This is an illustration of one of the all night dances that uh, Savannah Pume and uh, some of the River Pume still practice uh, in my uh, field sample. The Pume have 11 hour dances, uh, 36 to 52% of all nights I've been in residence. And it very much looks like this uh, engraving based on work by Jules Cravot, um, a French uh, military doctor who uh, did a long expedition into the Orinoco and was eventually killed supposedly by the Toba in Bolivia. And his work is the basis for Jules Verne's uh, popular book, or popular in some circles, uh, Mighty Orinoco. Another researcher in the 19th century was Jean Chafagnon, who collected a number of significant vocabularies and important observation and has the very first a couple of photographs that are um, curated in France. This is of a River Pume dry season camp identical to a um, Savannah Pume dry season camp in the modern era. River Pume still move periodically in the dry season for fishing along the major rivers, but they are much less mobile than these researchers encountered in the 19th and earliest 20th century. The first trained anthropologist that went in uh, to visit the Pume was Vincenzo Petrullo out of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, who was trying to set up a research institute in Venezuela and while waiting for various political issues to resolve themselves and to get appointments, made a quick trip in 1934 out to visit uh, River Pume populations and did the first uh, recorded ethnography with them. A number of um, unfortunate mistakes that took a a couple of decades to correct, he felt that they had a kinship system, including moieties, which was dead wrong. Um, but the next researcher that went out here, um, uh, uh, Henri Le Bessaret, and then um, Anthony Leeds, uh, 
collected other important information about these groups of people and were able to correct some of these um, initial um, observations. So there is a small record of work with uh, principally River Pume. Almost none of these researchers have ever worked with savanna communities. This map shows the portion of the area near the Kapanapa River where my research has uh, taken place and I was centered in the uh, green circle uh, identified as Doro Ana. In this map the green circles are Savannah Pume are shown in uh, blue squares. Uh, my work with my wife uh, Karen Kramer also a UNM graduate has also done work in these um, three river communities and three savanna communities for a variety of comparative demographic, uh, life history, and economic uh, data collection projects. So let's move out into the savanna away from these big rivers. Um, this is not the community where I've spent most of my time. This is the adjacent community of Yaguri, uh, but they're situated in a more open savanna setting that uh, makes a great uh, photographic opportunity. So away from these major drainages, the savanna pume live out in areas adjacent to um, areas that do have water, um, but are very uh, different than the um, habitation locations of uh, the river, uh, the river dwelling uh, pume who are on major drainages, as well as having a different kind of economy. This is a hyper seasonal savanna. There are approximately six months of dry season and six months of wet season when over 80% of the precipitation falls. Um, and I think it's about 180 centimeters a year is the mean amount of um, precipitation. These are rainfall data collected in Doroana uh, during my uh, field work in 1992 to 1993 that agree well with weather station data from north of the Capanaparo River, where significant amounts of biological research, uh, geomorphological research, hydrological research took place until Hugo Chavez shut down the tourist ranch uh, that also was the location where, where decades of biological data uh, had been collected. So the six months of wet and dry season are associated with changes in uh, Pume mobility and camp locations. During the wet season, about 60% of the savanna is covered with a few centimeters to a meter of water. And there's only a limited number of locations that are above the permanent flooding. So the wet season camps tend to be used for three to four years in a row before they are abandoned. Architectural elements are robbed. Um, any good thatch is moved, but the Camp is then sterilized through intentional burning of the savanna adjacent that usually wipes out any of the architectural elements that have not been robbed to use in a new location, sterilizing the environment because the crapping grounds are directly adjacent to these as well. And we know many uh, foraging and agricultural populations burn old habitations, which while they don't have any theory of uh, any idea of germ theory or microscopes, they certainly have worked out that cleansing these locations uh, is beneficial in the uh, long run. Um, so these are structures that are very similar uh, to what we see with other uh, South American uh, natives. Uh, these are robust structures with no walls. Uh, they are thatched roofs that, to withstand the extremely heavy rainfall that occurs during the wet season. The view in this slide is through the dance plaza. As I mentioned, dance is an important component of the social organization of these people. And I don't believe it's just ritual or hoo-ha. I believe it has a very important social function, but that's the subject of another talk. Every permanent dry and wet season camp has a dance plaza on the east side that, as I mentioned, hosts dances 36 percent of all time I've been there, varying between 36 and 52 percent of all nights where they sit out in these for 11 hours with a social dance uh, setting. The wet season is the lean season for the Pume. It is dominated by root collection and hunting as the major sources of food. The Pume would fish all year long if they could, but during the wet season, this flooded savanna results in fish escaping the bonds of the 
drainages and ponds in these areas and being widely dispersed across the flooded savanna. And you cannot effectively target those animals. They use that part of the uh, climate season as uh, when they uh, accrue a whole bunch of fat for gonadal recrudescence for coordinated reproduction uh, during the dry season. So the fish are actually in the worst condition at this time. They're widely dispersed and a large portion of the population are fry in relatively small sizes. Although we may don't have any problem with eating really tiny fish, even if I do. Um, hunting is therefore the only protein uh, collection activity uh, that's possible in this time, focusing principally on terrestrial game and a very small number of um, uh, arboreal animals such as uh, anteaters. Hunting is the highest mobility foraging activity of the Pume. My research specifically focused on technological use and relationship to foraging behaviors. So I collected a significant amount of information by going on foraging trips as much as possible, uh, mapping the travel distances <coughs> to look at how travel distance and encounter rates associate with returns and technological use. But again, that would be the subject of another um, discussion. This is the largest area that uh, the Pume search for resources, not surprisingly, as this is an impoverished environment. The low uh, uh, tree cover and grass dominance leads to a very depauperate fauna and uh, terrestrial biomass is widely dispersed. And this is not unexpected that hunting is the highest search um, activity for wild resources. And this map simply shows the foraging radii away from uh, the uh, wet uh, season camp on the left. The returns from hunting are pretty low. Um, these show two different samples from 1990 and from 1992 and 93. Um, and the mean return per hunter for all this is about two kilos per hunter per trip, which is pretty low. And 89% of the game comes from three species, small armadillos that weigh between 800 and 900 grams, tegu lizards, which weigh on average about 900 grams. And then the third most common game item is a 100 gram um, tayed lizard that the Pume spend as much time digging out as they do the larger animals. A very few game come in in the larger sizes, which for the Pume is anything six kilos or larger would be considered large game. Root collection is the other really critical component of wet season uh, subsistence. And not surprisingly, the travel distances are much shorter, but these are not search times in the same way. I had expected this would be a little more search, but actually women know exactly where they're going. And this is not uncommon in other parts of the ethnographic world as well. During any number of trips, women walk by these areas all the time and they know precisely where uh, root patches are and they know the condition of those roots. So there is no search involved in this. 90% of all trip time is devoted to direct access of resources. They simply travel out to the patch and then spend time moving through it in a foraging and collecting uh, format. Women know precisely what they're getting. Mean returns much higher than what men get. And only a few men any week are engaged in hunting, whereas groups of women go out several times a week so that there is absolutely more root food in camp than there ever is animal protein. These two old ladies are carrying a number of baskets and they know how much they will get. They're gonna fill up all of those baskets and there's a couple of additional cloth um, bags that are inside of those as well. If the return rate is lower than anticipated, they simply stay in the patch and you get a proportional return on your effort. So these are highly predictable uh, returns. Women know exactly where they're going. And this is the principal food that keeps the Pume alive in the wet season. Although the wet season is also associated with significant epidemiological challenges as well as low food input and the Pume say, this is the season when we get thin and die. The um, primary reliance on uh, 
roots is really interesting because this is also the season when the Pume practice a very small amount of manioc horticulture. Um, and I wasn't sure whether this is a situation of the replacement of wild foods with cultivated plants, but I'll mention a little bit later why I think that's not the case and that this is a relatively stable strategy of foragers combining the cultivation of some plants and that the um, archival record for the may as well as evidence from other populations shows that this can be a stable foraging strategy. You know, only anthropologists think that hunters and gatherers can't do other economic activities to add to their overall strategies. Whereas for hunters and gatherers, they simply have the ultimate diversified portfolio and they have no performing infrequent wage labor, adding in a small amount of manioc horticulture or any other kind of um, food production into their system as well. My next slide simply shows the contribution in the wet season, shown as half a pie of annual diet that emphasizes the importance of wild tubers, especially over manioc. Manioc is not a common food in this time. It's a supplement, and that's not surprising. Manioc grows well in the tropics, it is drought resistant, it can stand being uh, semi-flooded, and it is not the problematic seed crops that you have to invest garden labor and wait all season in order to get a return. You can dig manioc at any time of year. But it camps so that it is a supplementary food when wild tubers are not in camp and when other foods may not be available. So. The evidence suggests a stable combination of wild tuber collection along with manioc. And as I've said, this makes sense. Manioc is a lousy food. It has low protein, low fat, almost no minerals, vitamins. It is really just carbohydrate gut wad. Whereas some of the wild tubers, corms and bulbs that the Pume pursue have very significant uh, food values. Um, but it is a food supplement. And again, hunters and gatherers are not um, interested in just saying we can't do that because we're hunters and gatherers. They're very willing to do anything that provides uh, food. I have looked at this issue through records in the uh, Archivo General de Indias in Seville, where I was able to identify observations from the 18th century that populations out in this part of the savanna were combining mobile foraging with very, very small garden plots. And this slide shows the size and frequency of garden plots among Pume families is pretty low compared to horticulturalists or other agriculturists. Only less than half of all Pume families have any kind of plot. And the uh, size of them is really small, point, um, uh, one, two to point, uh, one point one to point one two hectares. These are small patches in comparison uh, to other populations. Uh, for contrast, the agricultural Maya that I work with, minimally a family needs about three hectares of land to support a family. Um, so all of these records, the historic record, the continuing combination of foraging along with some manioc horticulture suggest the existence of a stable combined strategy not a trajectory towards increased horticulture or agricultural reliance, at least among the savanna pume. Um, the dry season is the other six months of year. And for the pume, this is the good time of year when there's lots of food available. They move away from those high uh, areas that are not flooded moving closer to some of the uh, major drainages, and they don't need uh, much architectural investment, mostly brush shades, as you see in the left of this particular image. And the thatch structure on the left is really just a special activity or storage structure. But there's these two basic divisions in camps, wet season and dry season camps. The dry season, depends on subsistence from fishing and from the collection of feral mangoes. Most of these feral mangoes were planted by criollos up at the major drainages at least 60 to 70 years ago and produced significant quantities. But as in many parts of Latin America, uh, mangoes go to waste and fall to the ground. But for the Pume, this is a significant boon. There are a number of other wild 
tree fruits and other plant foods that the Pume pursue in the dry season, but feral mango have become a critical crop and frequently in camp, mango uh, is the major food source that people go for. And they're not just collecting the ripe mangoes, people are paying the travel cost by collecting as much quantity as they brought containers to carry and a significant amount of Um, and you can see that 29 kilos per woman per trip. And these are from these feral groves that are an eight kilometer one way um, travel uh, distance that they go in a straight. Turn to camp with 110% of their own body weight in uh, mangoes. And on the uh, lower right, you can see a woman boiling some of these green mangoes in order to soften them and convert some of the uh, carbohydrates uh, to sugars. Fishing is the other important food resource in this time period. And as you can see in this uh, map, fishing is very low distance uh, search. And these are not just visiting patches along the stream or lagoons, it is uh, with the expectation that you're gonna get fish, it's a check and leave strategy to see if the fish are biting. And what you can see is that the returns are comparable to the hunting returns per individual per trip, two kilos, but there is absolutely more fish in camp at this time of year. Because as my next slide points out, unlike hunting where only a few men are out any uh, day of the week, men hunt or fish almost every day. And almost every man is out fishing. And additionally, fishing is a low skill activity and several boys are able to come back to camp with returns that approximate adult level returns. So even though the return per trip is comparable, the absolute amount of protein in camp during the season is significantly greater than the input of terrestrial animal uh, protein. So this slide showing the percentage of uh, annual diet from the six months of uh, a dry season in this picture from Vincenzo Petrullo's uh, recording of beach activities among river pume um, shows that mangoes, tree fruit that includes feral mangoes principally, but also a few wild uh, fruits there as well, and fish form the principal component of the diet at this time. Um, pume hunters and fish and, and collectors also go after other resources. The concentration of fish in the streams and lagoons leads to a migratory bird concentration that is very popular with birders. Um, and bird hunting is a productive strategy at this time of year, and it can be done in the same locations where uh, hook and line or bow and arrow fishing are occurring. And there are certain wild tubers, corms, and bulbs that women collect in this season as well. So unlike the devastation uh, the devastating undernutrition and disease vectors in the wet season. The dry season has very few uh, insect pests, much lower epidemiological problems, and a much greater amount of food. <clears throat> this slide documents some of the mobility that we documented during uh, investigations in 2005 and 2006 to look at the number of camp moves among the Pume uh, from uh, for one particular season. And what you see in uh, blue or purple are the uh, dry or the wet season camps located on high ground and the orange uh, camps are wet season or dry season camps, some of them staged moving towards other kinds of locations uh, where the longer term dry season camp will be situated with images of the more robust architecture with stamp rains in the wet season and the abbreviated architecture of the dry season camps. The dry season is also associated with a number of temporary uh, camps out of that, uh, many of them for fishing that last up to a couple of weeks, uh, very common for these, for portions of the population to move out into these locations. And this is also sometimes when uh, raw material collection camps will also be made. Uh, travel is much easier in the dry season when uh, very little of uh, the savanna is flooded. 
um, so that these other locations can be visited more readily. From all of the different A, a region that the uh, Pume use, which is a little over 150 square uh, kilometers or so. And you can see how the other Savannah communities adjacent, these other red dots would have overlapping uh, territories in some of the margins of those as well. Um, one of the things that I did was to note where particular in-camp kinds of activities occurred. So in addition to focusing on subsistence, mobility, technological use in terms of foraging trips, I also used my time in camp to collect significant amounts of data through standard time allocation, uh, protocols of instantaneous scan samples every hour or focal, uh, focal follows, or I'm sorry, focal um, household scans where all activities for four hours were coded and then I would get up every hour and do uh, scan samples as well. And among the data that were collected was the location of different kinds of activities. So I have a number of observations about which activities occur in proximity to hearths and how often those hearths are actually lit. So I have activities at both cold hearths and active hearths um, so that we can look at how frequently uh, these hearths are used. And this simple histogram just shows that out of uh, the most common number of hearths in most structures, three of them, uh, most observations see no hearth use um, and most frequently one hearth is used and less frequently uh, multiple hearths. My next histogram just shows the number of different kinds of activities uh, that went along with hearth use. And not surprisingly, the largest, uh, the most frequent activity is cooking fire and then starting a fire. Um, people also just sit at hearths in the morning to warm themselves, but also just because they're doing some other uh, kinds of activities. And this just breaks down the different kinds of activities that are occurring frequently enough to even be shown on this uh, histogram. Um, so the majority of activities at Harz, unsurprisingly, are about cooking. Um, but of course, many other activities occur in proximity to hearths. And because women do most of the cooking, many of women's additional kinds of activities also occur in relationship to the uh, location of the hearth. Men's activities are much more limited. Um, and aero manufacture is one of the kinds of activities that occurs frequently enough to show up in the previous histograms I showed you. Um, and here's a man simply using a fire to heat up pieces of scrap uh, high carbon steel that he's turning into a variety of arrow points. This hearth would occasionally be used for cooking or warming, but is not one of the principal cooking hearths um, in this multifamily uh, structure. I selected a sample for this uh, analysis that included a period of time right after some Pume men had gotten back from doing a week and a half of wage labor for local criollos. And during the wet season when manioc was available because I was interested in looking at the frequency of cooking activities that involve cultigens or market foods. So this represents a period when the largest number of market foods are present within this camp, despite the amount of rice, pasta, oil that they earned as goods in exchange for labor, along with a couple of other currencies, market foods are still only the, the third most frequently observed cooking behavior. And Manioc, the production of manioc, which is a time consuming activity that would have been observed across multiple scan bouts is still less common than the uh, cooking of wild foods. Um, and again, they take much less time, whereas manioc requires uh, long periods of time to uh, cook uh, and to reduce the liquid afterwards. So it represents more actual um, uh, fewer actual bouts, but for longer numbers of observations. Um, my next slide simply shows a woman cooking at one of her uh, outside uh, hearths. And again, it's uh, not surprising that most of the activities that we're seeing around hearths 
are the activities of women. And my next histogram breaks down the activities by sex so that women's activities are shown in orange and men in green. And the only two activities that are occurring with any frequency enough to be observed around these horrors are the manufacture of arrows or the manufacture of hallucinogenic snuff. Many of these activities are occurring at specialized hearths that are not necessarily even cooking hearths. Many of these are at hearths that require a very minimal amount of fuel and do not necessarily have a fixed position and therefore don't represent the kinds of hearths that would be um, seen for these other activities of food cooking that are women's activities at fixed hearths, and the number of different hearths that they have within the house to accommodate different light and rain conditions. So my next histogram just points this out again in glaringly uh, uh, stark uh, images that it is overwhelmingly women's activities that are represented at HARS, and that includes a diversity of uh, behaviors. Here's a woman multitasking like men. You can see she's got mangoes to the left. She's actually got wild tubers uh, behind one of the children. Um, she's doing a bunch of caretaking, breastfeeding after getting back from uh, food collecting. Her mother is uh, getting uh, fire and roasting some mangoes. A tremendous number of activities are occurring here around this hearth with girls and women of multiple generations. In contrast, a very limited number of activities are performed by men. Um, this is an example of one of those large game items that came into camp, a six kilo Tamandua anteater, which is not much by many foragers uh, standards, but is big game for the Pume. And that's why all the kids are standing around because there are 80 adults, uh, there are 80 people in this camp and every single one of them is gonna get a piece of that meat that you see in front of you. And note to the left of the piece of sheet metal being used for butchering is a small hearth with a minimum amount of fuel that was used to singe the animal before butchering. This um, arrow manufacturer, like the previous one I showed you, is using essentially two warm sticks to heat up resin and to occasionally heat up the arrow cane itself for manufacture. So what you're seeing is that men's activity is using minimal amounts of fuel at minimally archeologically visible kinds of surface hearths in contrast with the kinds of hearths where women are working. Here's another example of an arrow making hearth. And you can see here again, uh, below the man, two sticks with um, coals that are used to heat up the resin that he's employing to uh, put the components together. And here's the other activity that shows up on the histogram, the production of hallucinogenic snuff, which is done at hearths to toast it and calcine the shell that, uh, that contributes calcium carbonate to increase the, psycho the psychotropic effect of this. That is the only other activity that men do in this set of sample observations that are occurring with any frequency enough to show up on that particular histogram. One of the revelations of this is that we really don't need to create novel paradigms about feminist archaeology to say that we need to look at all the things we're, uh, that women do because we've actually been overemphasizing the work that men do. We overemphasize the contribution of meat and how it may organize activities and the structure of the archaeological record. But clearly, the observations of Harz here with the Pume are not irrelevant to hearth use among a number of other populations uh, throughout the world, and as a lesson for what we should be seeing around hearths. Um, I still am surprised that probably the vast majority of archeological inferences about hearth use focus on men making tools, men roasting meat, men doing things, despite our ethnographic knowledge that a variety of these practices are the behaviors of women. We already have a robust archeological record of women's activities right at hearths, but our prejudice about the importance of meat or the assumption that men are doing the majority of stone tool manufacture means that we have not paid attention to the diversity of activities at hearths that almost certainly provide a greater set of observations about what women's activities are around hearths. And here's just two other examples 
of the kinds of activities that will leave archaeological signatures at hearths. Um, all of these materials that these women are using, these palm fibers, are rich in phytoliths and the processing law and loss of some of those raw materials, as well as the rolling of string weaving. These are activities that uh, cover hours and hours of activity. And some of my data collection indicates that it is principally the manipulation of organic materials that takes up the greatest amount of time, the greatest number of bouts at HARS or as technological manufacturer in general, contrasted with, with activities involving what we would consider to be hard uh, materials that would have an analog to stone in the archeological record. Overwhelmingly, we're looking at a, a record of activities of manufacture and maintenance that are involving organic materials processed and uh, worked on by women in proximity to hearths. So I want to segue a little bit from these simple observations that were outside of my initial research trajectory, but quite starkly um, informative about what we should really expect in the archaeological record to segue a little bit into a couple of observations about wells and then to look at what I um, uh, have been looking at in terms of uh, waterhole use among uh, Maya agriculturalists. So camps are moved but not in relationship to food resources. The, tr the distance between dry and wet season camps is minimal and affords no real reduction in travel time during subsistence trips. The reason that people change camp locations is to be closer to water. This is the um, creek adjacent to the dry season camp that is starting to fill with water as the rains come at the end of the dry season. And all of the savanna that you can see in this image will be flooded with adjacent to the stream. It's gonna be at least a meter deep to a few centimeters further away. And the savanna pume do not collect water out of flowing water holes. And those of you that backpack know that flowing water looks really nice, but flowing water is carrying a number of contaminants from the land surface. And in our world, that's agricultural uh, contamination with pesticides and fertilizers. But there's a number of other heavy metals in tropical soils that will run off into these as well. River Pume people take it directly out of the big river, but Savannah Pume never take water out of those locations for drinking. They dig wells at each of the dry and wet season camps. Even when they're living directly adjacent to the stream, they dig these small wells and allow water to settle, which takes out some of those heavy metals, some of the muck, although the water is a little dirty, but it's actually a, a smart technique for getting the cleanest water that you possibly can. And when wells get to be about seven to 800 meters away from camp, women start complaining and say, it is time to move camp. Because any of you, again, that backpack know that water weighs eight pounds per gallon, it is one of the heaviest things you have to carry with you. And populations are probably not carrying water significant distances unless they end up in uh, certain kinds of problems. Archeologically, I don't think we've addressed HARS and water control features in as significant a fashion as we should. This uh, slide shows Mustang Springs in Texas where um, there was one of the uh, good studies looking at wells uh, by Dave Meltzer uh, finding wells at this confluence of a variety of dry uh, current drainages where a number of human excavated well features could be found in this location. As a, a CRM archaeologist, I know that our paperwork often identifies areas where people could get water and often the checklist is places up to a mile away. Well, except under really unusual conditions, that's hauling a lot of heavy material several times a day, which is unlikely in many locations. Now, I know that CHIP has done some important work in looking at water control features at Chaco, and I was recently reminded of some of that when I was visiting Tsipin Owinge up by Abiquiu Reservoir just a few weeks ago. The large site that's estimated to have maybe up to a thousand people or so, if it was occupied uh, all at the same time, has a large number of these round 
features into the bedrock that have been called bedrock kivas. Now, maybe they are. I've been told that they have some kind of kiva-like features, but these are all situated outside the margins of the room block, outside of most of the locations of the kivas, except the great kiva at this particular location. There is a wall at the edge of the mesa that was identified as a potential reservoir, but these are really interesting features into bedrock that would almost certainly have led to the capture of some kind of water unless they were sealed. And at least one of them um, has a channel into it uh, that could pr uh, presumably allow uh, water to come in as well. I'm not gonna argue with the archeologists, but I think we need to address the archeological visibility of water features in a more significant way than we have in the past. This was something else um, that I was able to see in some of the work that I've been assisting with in the agricultural Maya community of Shkulok in the Yucatan Peninsula at the uh, uh, frontier of Estado Campeche with Estado Yucatan. Um, that is a project my wife has been working on uh, since 1992. Um, the Maya village of Shkulok was initially a community of around 300 people when my wife, Karen Kramer, started working there in 1992. And it is now over 500 people from uh, mostly just um, in place uh, population growth. And the village name comes uh, from a word for a figure from an archeological site uh, without feet. It is situated at a former hacienda. Much of the um, community has remained relatively traditional in a region that is dominated by Maya as the major ethnicity uh, throughout. And until really the early 2000s, this community was relatively isolated without a paved road uh, with minimally functional uh, flowing water and minimal electricity. Um, that has changed in, in the recent past, but most aspects of Maya subsistence are still subsistence agriculture with a little bit of uh, sale uh, of these products. Um, and these are just two images of uh, the important maize fields that form the majority of the three hectares that each family has and some supplemental crops uh, that are grown uh, closer into the community. While we were doing a variety of different work that's part of uh, Karen's uh, research on demography, subsistence and changing activities in relationship to some of the ongoing uh, changes in the modern world, we were quantifying a variety of things about the subsistence base, about how much land is under cultivation, what the uh, uh, harvest returns were, what the sale portions of those crops were, what the economic layout is for uh, commercial products that uh, Maya people use uh, for this. People started showing us where water holes were. Um, and I thought this was really cool, but I didn't realize that this was potentially something that could be a really interesting adjunct study during the work that we were doing um, at Shkulok. <clears throat> As I mentioned, a large focus of what uh, my work was doing was going out in the field, measuring these fields with uh, GPS technology, getting information on the amount of seed, fertilizer, and if they're using herbicides, how much of that they were using, the cost of that, as well as the recent crop returns, the amount of crops uh, that were sold. So a variety of economic activities have been the focus of some of the research. And these observations I'm going to outline to you were part of uh, things that people identified um, as of interest while we we're working away from the community. As part of the economic diversification study, we started looking at the significant contribution that apiaries provide certain households that are willing to work. And one of the critical things about maintaining an apiary is in order not to lose your bees, you need to feed them some kind of sugar water during the periods of time when there is not flowering so that they don't uh, fly away. And what we noticed was that apiaries were preferentially located in proximity to natural water holes in this environment because again, water is really heavy. And while they now have very recently uh, some uh, dirt bikes, water often had to be hauled uh, by hand. Um, draft animals died out in the 1970s and have not been used. They were often carried, uh, water had to be carried on bicycles or by hand. So that locating these saves the travel cost of otherwise having to mix water uh, that is extremely heavy. 
Anyone who's worked in the Yucatan knows that this is an interesting environment with no rivers, ponds, surface lakes at all. All of the water flow is underground or collecting in natural solution cavities called dolines in English or within this karst environment. This is outside of the major um, cenote region, the margin of that big Chicxulub uh, meteor crater. And so there are none of the larger uh, solution uh, uh, cavities that you have in that area. There's very small natural solution cavities um, and mostly just these really tiny um, or moderately large uh, solution cavities in uh, the environment as well that do hold water. Water was something that uh, was introduced by um, the Mexican government in the 1970s, feeling that native people definitely needed water, but the functioning of the system was imperfect. And while running water was installed in the 1970s, it didn't work very well. And into my earliest bit of research in Chukuluk, water was regularly hauled out of the well by hand with um, 50 meter lengths of rope, uh, pulling this from a deep uh, uh, well uh, that is part of the former Hacienda structure. This is a well that was uh, dug with steel implements uh, by the creators of uh, this Hacienda until it was abandoned as the Hacienda system collapsed at the early part of the 20th century. Um, so I began my work uh, mostly working out in gardens, uh, collecting a variety of measurement and interview data. And many of these are in the proximity to some of these uh, particular sartanejas or solution cavities. So uh, I went out to these garden locations, uh, the light green in these particular things, well away from uh, the center of the community. And the population was very interested in also pointing out where these water holes were to me, which I wasn't smart enough to realize why they were taking the time uh, to show these to me. Archaeologically, the vast number of, of archaeological sites in the vicinity of Shkulok have a number of architectural control features of artificially created chaltuns, wells that are excavated uh, into the um, uh, limestone, some into natural fissures, and there's several researchers that feel that some aspects of architecture are designed to encourage run, runoff of water and use architecture itself as a means of channeling water into places where it can be um, stored and uh, predictably uh, located. So people took me out to see these things and I've collected data on the names, locations, dimensions, depth of over 50 uh, sartanejas in the uh, outback of these areas. Um, and one of the other things that I identified was whether these are recharged by groundwater, vados water moving through the rock, or if they're only seasonally filled uh, by rainfall. Informants told me about past uses, current uses, and it also initiated a number of important uh, demographic uh, statements that we had been trying to research uh, that uh, we didn't get any answers to that I'll outline uh, just a little bit later. So informants were able to take me to these uh, water holes. It was very easy to get information and we could quickly visit a large number of these. This map shows the location of a number of the water holes that uh, we've mapped. The ones in red are adjacent to apiaries and the ones in blue are um, uh, sartanejas that are out away from those, some of them in proximity uh, to gardens. This linear feature down to the southeast is the formerly unpaved road that used to take about an hour and a half to drive in. It now takes about 20 minutes after it was paved in uh, 2005, I think. This is the same map showing the location of uh, garden plots um, out in the area where these natural solution cavities are located. Um, one of the most important differences between uh, Sartanejas is whether they contain water all year long or they're only seasonally available from rainfall. Um, I mentioned one of the issues about where um, families uh, were living in adjacent to some of these. And Karen had been asking people, where did you live before the Hacienda system collapsed? 
and you were able to move in and take control of this particular land in the very important well. And people said, eh, you know, we, we lived over there, we came from here, eh, that's really not important. As one finds ethnographically, questions that are sort of in the abstract often get dismissed and are hard to get answers to. Uh, people had very little interest in, in answering those questions. However, when we went to the Sartane house, informants would volunteer, oh yeah, Don Pedro's family used to live here for a number of years before they moved into town. And these, especially these large, permanently filled Sartanejas where the were the locations where dispersed families were living until the collapse of the Hacienda system allowed aggregations of these extended families into a single community, in this case at the former Hacienda of Ashkulok, a place that was visited by um, Catherwood uh, during his work in this area. We found that every single Sartaneja we visited had a function even in the current time. And even these only seasonally available Sartanejas were critical. Um, these two examples are uh, solution cavities near to the village that are relatively shallow. Um, and some of these have several such small holes in them. And what you're seeing is uh, laundry rocks that you pound uh, laundry on. So even with a much more secure water system, occasionally that uh, well will go out. And even in the more reliable current times, people will go out here for a variety of activities, including one of the constant needs is to wash uh, clothes. Every Sartaneja we visited has a name, has a number of activities that are associated with it, and is maintained and used. Every single Sartaneja we saw was being used. And some of the ones that hadn't been visited in a while, informants took the time to clear them off and remove debris. Even the furthest away um, Sartanejas all had use either as water sources for hunting or some other activity. All of them had particular activities that were maintained in the cultural system. This one example in this slide on the left is a tiny Sartaneja with a capstone adjacent to a garden to prevent the evaporation from this water recharged uh, location, even for the small amount of water that it contains. And what we found was that a variety of artifacts older ceramic jars that are uh, almost never used anymore, metal vessels, plastic water bottles are cached at these locations to use for a variety of these tasks. So they do still present an evolving uh, material culture assemblage that indicates the time depth of their use as well. And I mentioned that one of the things we've been trying to uh, look at was where families came from who eventually coalesced at these Hacienda systems. Um, all of these Maya peasant systems had a variety of different kinds of social organization, probably in prehistoric times, as well as in the more recent era. Um, and now many of these communities have focused on haciendas, but we don't know as much about the dispersed nature of habitation prior to that. And we actually got nowhere in asking some of that. So we've been to the um, Archivo General de Indias, Maya people have surnames, which is incredibly useful. You can look at the distribution of particular families in different parts of the Yucatan to try to see where some of the more common uh, surnames used in Shkulok would have come from. But even that was not fine enough to help us better understand the economic dynamics prior to uh, the period when people uh, came to the, uh, the abandoned hacienda and the earliest part of the 20th century. My last slide simply shows Karen Kramer, um, a research colleague, uh, Ryan Schott, and in the bottom left, uh, Vitaliano Canur Pat, uh, one of our most important informants at a very large um, Sartaneja at the margin of a Shkulok that is profoundly deep. Uh, we took a stick and tried to get down as far as we could in this that forms a boundary location with the furthest margins of Shkulok and adjacent populations. So this was a really interesting set of studies that were things that the Maya were very interested in showing us. I wasn't necessarily cognizant of why this was critical when they first started showing me these, but it not only taught me something about the economic system in Shkulok among this group of agriculturalists, but it helped me better understand 
aspects of water control and the critical nature of developing better ways to address these issues in archaeology. This is the hardest thing in ethnoarchaeology is not just pretending that you're learning something about how people make things at the ethnographic scale, because how we look at that in the archaeological temporal scale is phenomenally difficult. This is actually showing something at that deep temporal archaeological scale, which is what we want to learn through ethnoarchaeology, how to transform those commanding and detailed observations of the modern world and ethnography into tools that can be used for expanding what we can understand in the archaeological record. So thank you very much um, for your patience and listening to me about this. I'm happy to entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Rusty. That was fascinating and, 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 and covered a lot of ground. It was really wonderful. Um, if people have questions, I encourage you just to turn on your camera and, and go ahead and ask a question. <clears throat> um, I have a question. Uh, so I, I was, I, uh, I am curious to what extent you think that the manioc uh, uh, portion of the diet in the Savane uh, uh, Savannah uh, Pume is um, necessary for survival in the Savannah environment. Uh, is that, uh, I mean, it, it definitely seems to um, enable it to come to degree, but I'm just wondering, is, is this something that you think uh, was only, that life in, in the Savannah environment, at least during the wet season, was only possible uh, once people started to adopt some horticultural practices or whatever? I don't think so. I think the involvement with some manioc is probably longstanding. Again, the only record I have of that are some of the early documents uh, that I was able to encounter in the Archivo General de Indias in Seville. And that was a two month investigation of uncatalogued documents where you're simply scanning um, old paper, skimming for important words. But I found several. Um, observations by Spanish were out mostly reducing populations to bring them to mission locations. These were, many of them were military individuals, not just the religious folks, and they were familiar with what real gardens look like that are for agricultural populations or more horticulturally reliant populations. And the way they described the kinds of plots they found at these mobile camps, they identified these as not permanent camps, was that these were extremely small, supplemental gardens. That's the best evidence I have. The archeological record of this region, uh, archeologists focus on complex society, agricultural adaptations, and the hunter-gatherer record from out here is poorly understood. I don't know when the Pume got out there. They are unique biologically. They are not linguistically nor genetically related to the largest ethnicity in this area, which are uh, Guajibo and people. So for example, the Hiwi, whom uh, Kim Hill, Magdalena Hurtado, um, and uh, Hilly Kaplan worked with, were a, um, are a foraging component of the larger agricultural Guajibo and population. Um, they're kind of the people that got pushed to the margin. The closest <clears throat> I can find to any uh, linguistic connection is to populations in Western Colombia. And that's recent work by a linguist out of the Max Planck Institute. So the Pume are genetically distinct from the Guajiboan population. Their language has often usually been characterized as independent, but of course, South American linguistics are in a complete disarray, very little interest in linguistics um, and mapping linguistic distributions has occurred since the latest 19th and early 20th century. Um, so the, the earliest evidence I can get is that foraging in this environment may well need to have this other supplement because everything you can get in that wet season is going to be critical. And this is true in looking at octa populations in the Philippines who in our earliest observations are trading for rice or for um, Mikea populations in Madagascar who are attempting to grow maize, or now the government said you can't grow maize, you can only grow manioc. They are supplementing their foraging with these other kinds of resources. And there's been a significant amount of uh, question. You know, the, the Kalahari debate, for example, was an opportunity to try to say, gee, hunters and gatherers who periodically do wage labor 
work as livestock herders, work as agriculturalists, you know, the debate became this classificatory thing. Oh, are they real hunters and gatherers or are they fake or what happens? Well, what it shows is that through time, foragers can do practically anything. And as long as they have that linguistic and oral traditional information about how you do things, you can spend a little time doing something else and go back and forage without those other activities. Hunting and gathering includes that diversified portfolio that includes activities that we anthropologists wouldn't consider foraging, but hunters and gatherers definitely would consider part of having that diversified set of options. So I think there's enough examples in other parts of the world that many, for, I mean, the, the, the so-called pygmy populations of Central Africa with their trade and exchange relationships with the agricultural villagers are another ideally documented case of populations in areas that have had long interaction with their agricultural and sedentary uh, neighbors as well. So I think this is not an uncommon way that hunters and gatherers find ways to make a living in challenging environments. Interesting. I could talk a lot about that, but yeah, that, that was really fascinating. Any, are there any other questions? Um, well, I guess I have oh. one more question, uh, unless somebody else does. Rusty, I was wondering, did you collect any data with regard to the amount of fuel wood that's being utilized, say by... I I, that's a really good question. I didn't, and I, part of the problem was I had a, a difficult time trying to figure out how to quantify wood. Um, I certainly noted um, fuel returns, and what I would normally identify was big load of wood, little load of wood. It's just, it, it was very difficult for me uh, to try to figure out a reliable method for quantifying uh, wood returns. Um, with more researchers, one could assign someone, you know, go measure that or do something like that. But um, I did, you know, I weighed food returns and stuff, but I did not feel that I had a good way to pounce on everybody when they came in uh, with fuel wood to get a sample of that. One of the things I also thought would be important in wood that um, I've not yet figured out how to implement and then the political and economic crisis in Venezuela has made additional research highly problematic was that because the Pumay never used stone in this environment. They used bone, but they don't use that anymore for projectile points. I didn't have a good analog for reductive uh, technology like stone. Um, and one of the things I thought would be looking at raw materials that are coming in as wood, the, the amount that comes in, the waste volume and things like that, because wood is, is shaved, trimmed, cut, chopped into technology would be the way to get at an analog to the amount of uh, debitage debris from lithic manufacture that would at least be useful. I just never had a chance before the whole Venezuelan political and economic scene uh, went into such an incredible black hole to be able to implement that. But that's one of the things that I would like to do with that. And of course, I would love to have better uh, data on firewood, but I do not. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I think I'm going to hold off on my second question because I, I feel like the, the, the we're, we're sort of over time and a lot could be said about it. But I do want to follow up with you later about the dancing. I am uh, intrigued about what you think is uh, the, the functions of dancing. Um, but uh, anyway, if there are no other questions, uh, please join me in thanking Rusty and, and welcoming him back to, to UNM. This has really been a, a fantastic opportunity uh, to, to connect again. So welcome back. Uh, Rusty, and thank you so much. All right, thank you, folks. It's my pleasure. All right, everybody have a wonderful weekend.